Well, hello there, everyone. Coming to you from home today. This is April the 16th, 2020. Uh, web presentation for the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. We're going to talk to you today a little bit about grazing terminology and definitions. And I got to admit, when I started thinking about doing this topic, it was because I'd just come back from the Western Pennsylvania Grazing Conference and they had talked about some things there that I wasn't quite sure what the definition was. And so I figured how better than to look up definitions or try to figure out what those things were and to also put them in presentation form for all of you. And then as I did the presentation, I thought, boy, you know, maybe we're going a little too basic, but I'll tell you, uh, as I did the research and kind of looked through some other terminology, I, I, I really found out that I, I learned a lot myself, um, had some, some grazing epiphanies along the way, and uh, really enjoyed putting this one together. I will say that, that I put a, a really big presentation together, and I ran through it once, and it was going to be almost an hour long. So I've cut it way down, and uh, we'll probably have to pick up some other grazing terminology uh, somewhere on down the road. But we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, first I wanted to talk uh, about the management definitions or the management descriptions of grazing. But first, uh, let me say that th there's no real written down definition of a lot of the terms we're going to discuss here. And so you're getting the Clint Vinnie version of each of these uh, terms or, or words that we use. And uh, I may not be exactly right, but it, it's the best that, that I can find and the best that I can put together. Certainly, we can do some more research and some more thinking and talking about what each one of these terms means to us as we go through this presentation. But uh, first one on the list there, management intensive grazing will always be uh, shown as, as capital M, small i, capital G. And, and that's because when Jim Garrish coined the phrase management intensive grazing, he wanted all the focus for intensity to be on management and not on grazing. Um, <clears throat> we want our management to be intensive and not the grazing. It's real easy to have intensive grazing. You put too many animals in too small a space and leave them for too long a time and that's intensive grazing or what we would call overgrazing. but we want our management uh, to be intensive. It, it's the, the management that we make intensive for the grazing. So management intensive grazing is all about the forage and letting it get to uh, the correct height before we graze it, uh, removing the animals when they get to the residue we're shooting for. So bluegrass two inches, three inches, uh, orchard grass fescue four inches of residue and removing the animals, moving them on to another paddock. There being a rotation involved there, rotating to a new paddock. Um, typically, the stays in a paddock would be less than three days because we, we don't want the animals to, to regraze plants that are starting to regrow after a grazing event. Uh, we don't return to a paddock until the, the height is, is where we, our target is for, for entering a paddock. And uh, we'll skip a paddock if we need to, um, if the forage isn't grown enough to be able to put the livestock in. And then management intensive grazing takes in stockpiling and winter feeding. And, and really at its core, its focus was on reduction of cost for grazing and, and for farming in general, and, and also increased production per acre. With management intensive grazing, we, we do see sometimes that our individual production or, or per cow or per steer has gone down a little bit, but our overall production per acre it, it has, has actually gone up. So um, Mr. Garrish wrote a great book by that same name, Management Intensive Grazing. If you're interested, it's out there and it goes through all those things. Um, <clears throat> while we're on that same thought, I, I hope that these terms here we'll, we'll be putting into a, a future presentation um, I'm probably going to call it stepping up our grazing game and we're going to go a little more in depth into some of these. So I'm trying to hold myself back and not put everything into each one of these. The next one there, mob grazing, 
Uh, this is something that, that I've said that I've been doing for years. And as I did the research for this presentation, I, I kind of realized that maybe maybe I'm doing it wrong or, or maybe maybe it's not what I exactly want to be doing every time. But mob grazing typically uses high stocking densities uh, per acre. So a stocking density of 100,000 pounds per acre plus. Um, for those of you that don't know uh, how we calculate that, stocking density is, is how many pounds of animal is on that acre. So if we want to get 100,000 pounds per acre of stocking density, and we've got 10,000 pounds of cattle in our herd, we need to split that acre up 10 times to be able to get 100,000 pounds per acre of stock density. So we, one, we've got to have enough forage out there to graze and keep those animals on for, for a day and it be split up 10 times. Um, but also we've, we've got to split that acre up 10 times to get that stocking density. Um, mob grazing incorporates longer rest periods and things. Really the, at the core of mob grazing, it's, it's thinking about putting all of our livestock in one big group or mob. Uh, so our growing steers, our finished steers, our calves, our cows, our stalkers, if we've got other grazing livestock, putting them all out there in one big group. Um, tall grass grazing kind of follows along with that. Uh, we, we'd be grazing stuff that's kind of over mature, maybe has gone to seed um, at brown. And, and the hope of tall grass grazing is when we, when we go those ultra high stocking densities, that the livestock are trampling the forage that's over mature, returning it back to the soil, and they're grazing the vegetative parts of, of that, the sward that we have out there. Uh, the, the real issue with tall grass grazing is we're allowing the forage to get over mature. And, and as we think about grazing, we think about it being a solar panel out there um, and collecting sunlight. And, and if, if we've let that forage get over mature, then it's no longer collecting the sunlight that it could be. Here in Eastern Ohio, we only get seven, eight months of growing season. We don't want to let that solar panel get dirty or shaded, I guess is the way to think about it. We want it to stay green and growing and vegetative. And that may have been the biggest epiphany I had while I was doing the research for this um, presentation is that at times I'm letting things get too tall. That was the way I knew how to do mob grazing was let it get too tall with a lot of, of forage out there per acre. And in doing so, I'm hurting myself in the production end because I'm not keeping it vegetative and keeping it growing. Adaptive grazing, quite honestly, why I started in and did this is because I wanted to really know what adaptive grazing was. Uh, over at the Western Pennsylvania Grazing Conference, Alan Williams talked a lot about adaptive grazing, and I really didn't know the definition. So to me, as I did some research, and there are some really awesome YouTube videos, there's a whole series out there on adaptive grazing that Alan Williams did. So um, it, 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 it's core, it's kind of rolling management intensive grazing, mob grazing, ultra high stocking density grazing, kind of rolling those all in together. And, and it's just what it says, it's adaptive. So at times we're at low stocking density, depending on our, our goals. At times we're at high stocking densities, depending on you know, we may have a problem weed we're trying to, to mob up and, and graze hard or, or trample. Um, we may have tall grass that we need to be able to put them in a high stocking density to get them to actually eat, consume, and trample that forage. But adaptive grazing is adapting our grazing management to our current situations, the seasons, how the grass is growing, and what our herd needs. And, and it may have rolled in a little bit of the holistic management we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, rotational grazing, this is one that I, I think is kind of the slang term for management intensive grazing. But to me, rotational grazing is uh, somewhere that we've, we've got a set number of paddocks and we rotate through them at a set number of days. So really we're rotating by the calendar. Uh, I, I've set up a lot of these systems, designed a lot of these systems. The farmer usually goes, says something like, well, I can only move them once a week. So we set up a system with five to seven pastures. They move them once a week. Uh, there's really not any thought put into the forage. It's all put into the calendar. That to me is a rotational grazing system where we're just rotating based on the calendar. And in continuous or set stock grazing, uh, when we talk about continuous, we're talking about an area where the animals are just out there loose. There's no real rotation to it. Uh, they may be there season long. They may be there month long. 
uh, really anytime we leave animals in a paddock more than let's say 10 days uh, we're at that sort of continuous grazing level because our utilization rates have fallen to a point that um, they're the same as if we would have left them there all season. Albeit, if there's a rotation of any kind, it's better than continuous and being there all season. But uh, anytime we've been in a paddock, probably more than 10 days, we're, we're getting to that continuous uh, grazing kind of situation. Then regenerative agriculture, um, that's kind of the new term out there. Um, if I had to pick a kind of a face of regenerative agriculture, it's a, a guy by the name of Gabe Brown in North Dakota. Uh, but the regenerative agriculture folks really take soil health into account. Uh, a lot of them are cropland producers that are integrating livestock into their cropling rotations. Um, as, as Gabe Brown talks about it, he's got regenerative agriculture right there on his ranch sign as you go into his place in North Dakota. And one of the things he said in one of the presentations I listened to was, you know, we, we wanted to talk about being sustainable and, and I didn't want to be sustainable. I wanted to be regenerative. I wanted our ranch to get better than what it was. So that's sort of the thought for regenerative agriculture is, is they want to regenerate. And, and it's also partially realizing that our soils are degraded. They're degraded from the time we arrived here and we're, we wanted to put them back to as good or better a state than they were when we arrived. And then holistic management um, created by a man named Alan Savory uh, in Africa, but also has some, some interest in the Southwest desert areas of this country. But holistic management is, is a whole management system and it can be for wildlife, it can be for grazing animals. Incorporate some of the high stocking density stuff. That's where some of the mob grazing stuff comes from. Adaptive grazing certainly includes some of the, the holistic management stuff, but it, it was really created for some of the brittle climates uh, and, and managing those brittle climates and getting them to produce forage again. So um, there, there again, there's a really good book Alan, wrote, Alan Savory wrote uh, about holistic management. It's a very, very hard read, but it's a very good read on what holistic management is. And it's kind of managing all the parts of your grazing operation or of your field or farm. Next, we're gonna talk a minute about pastures and, and, and the different terminology we use for pastures. So a, a paddock for goes under many different definitions, I think, as we talk about grazing. But to me, a paddock is the the interiorly fenced areas in our larger pasture area. So at home, we have 14 paddocks. Then we can infinitely break those paddocks up into smaller areas that we should probably call cells. I usually call them breaks, uh, but a paddock to me is, is a internally fenced area inside our larger pasture area. So from that, you can take a cell, a cell being for me, it's one day's grazing or 12 hours worth of grazing. I guess it's it's your grazing durations, uh, time or length. So it, for some of us, a cell and a paddock would be the same thing. For some of us, it's different. Like I said, I use the term break, uh, especially in a paddock where I've split it up maybe three different times and I've allowed them to walk back to water for those that 24 hour or uh, however many hours that time is. U usually it's less than three days. I may give them breaks within a paddock and, and allow them to walk back to water as long as it's less than three days. From there, strip grazing. Um, strip grazing is something we use in the fall when we do um, stockpile grass, stockpile grazing. Uh, strip grazing typically is giving the animals a small strip and then allowing them to walk back to water. And this may be for a month in the wintertime that we keep giving them more strips and allow them to walk back to water because we're really not concerned with how much forage they're going to be picking at what they've already walked over because we're not in the growing season. Bale grazing, sort of like strip grazing with bales. Uh, we have the bale set stock down there at 25 foot centers typically. We build temporary electric fence around those bales and then we move the temporary fence to allow the livestock access to the bales. So used a lot in the western states. Uh, we talked about that couple of presentations ago for here in Ohio, but is a good system, uh, especially if we get frozen weather. Creep grazing, something we might do with cows and calves. We may build
build an area in the fence so that the cows can or calves can get to the next day's grazing or next week's grazing to allow them to kind of pick a, a better forage or, or have a better meal than what their mothers are eating in the paddock that they're in. Creep grazing can use a creep gate, it can use a, a raised area in the fence or simply the calves can go under the one strand wire to get to the next field to creep graze. Leader follower grazing, sort of along that same line. Uh, what we do there is we're putting the, the animals that are on a higher nutritional plane ahead of the animals that don't need to be. So let's think grass finishing steers in the front paddock and cows in the second pasture. So the cows follow this, the grass finishing steers. So the, the grass finishing steers are only eating the best and the cows are eating what's left over or eating the rest uh, before we move them on. So the steers move ahead, the cows fill in the field that the steers were in. And then flash grazing is something we talk about if we're grazing, say like riparian areas that we fenced out. So streams, creeks, ponds, places we may only turn the cows in there for an hour or two hours or a very short duration. So if they go in, they graze, and we get them out of there before they lounge around and before they have a chance to degrade that area by tramping down stream banks or wading into ponds. Those are, are areas that we would do flash grazing. Uh, we'll talk about forages. Um, I, here I just kind of threw in some terms that maybe everybody's not uh, really up on and, and also maybe some things that need a little bit better definition to them. So. A sward. A sward would be all of the forages contained in our pasture or in a paddock. Um, so our grasses, legumes, forbs, weeds, everything that's out there that is grazable is what we consider our sward out there in the pasture. Uh, dry matter we talked about a little bit last week and I don't, don't feel like I left it with a very good definition. So dry matter is the uh, dry matter equivalent of our pastures. Uh, dry matter typically is around 14% moisture. That's shelf stable for grains and for haze. So we figured dry matter based on that. So if a cow eats 3% of their body weight in dry matter, a uh, thousand pound cow, that's 30 pounds of dry matter per day. The thing we have to remember is this time of year, our grasses are really wet. Our forages are really wet. They're 90% moisture. So that means that they have to eat a whole lot more pounds of forage to cover that dry matter need. So uh, we convert everything to dry matter because we don't know what the moisture content of the forage is. We know dry haze, dry matter but we don't know our forages. So when we're talking about how much a cow eats, we always convert it to dry matter. Residue or residual, um, there again, my challenge to everyone to leave a, a more of a residue. Residue is what we leave behind us. So that four inches that we left when we when we moved the cows on or livestock on. Uh, in, a, in a cornfield, the residue is the leftover corn fodder that's come through the combine. Uh, I maintain we should come up with a better term than that. Residue still sounds like waste to me. It doesn't sound like uh, what we what we want to leave behind. And it takes grass to grow grass. And, and if we leave that residue, we'll have grass next time. If we take it all, we won't have grass when we're ready to come back to it. The spring flush, something we're going to talk about in the web presentation here coming up. Uh, if you're looking at that percentage total growth by month chart down below, uh, it's the green line. It's that first real big bump in our forage production. We're going to be hitting that here in a couple weeks um, when everything seems to be putting on a seed head and we can't get ahead and we can't graze enough grass. The cows physically aren't eating enough grass. That's the spring flush. Conversely, the summer slump follows that up. It's a time of the year when the forages just kind of stop growing. Uh, typically brought on by lack of water. It's thought that it it's heat related, but it really is more a lack of moisture. Even though those are our, some of our wetter months, it's that we have so much heat that, that our water around here turns to humidity and, and is in the air and not in the soil and not feeding the plants. Stockpile, we talked a little bit last slide about stockpiled forage would be uh, forages that we've grown uh, for the purpose of grazing later in a time when forages 
aren't actively growing. So that could be it's typically the fall and winter, but also could be the summer slump. We could be doing tall grass grazing in that summer slump area. And then pugging, something we talk about this time of year. Pugging basically is when we've grazed a, a pasture that was too wet, or we had livestock in a pasture when it was too wet. Um, their hoof action has caused the, the soil to lose all of its pore space. Soils always have pore space for both air and water. And if the cows especially get to tromping around in wet pastures, they do what we call pugging them up. And, and that is that they leave hoof tracks and they, they push out all the air and water and pore space. And so the plants have nothing left to grow on. The microbes are even going to be severely affected because there's no air for them to get in the soil. Wanted to talk just a minute about animal units and how they pertain to our grazing system. So an animal unit typically is a thousand pound beef cow. If we talk about an animal unit, we're talking about a thousand pound beef cow. And so we convert our actual cow weight down to thousand pound beef cow range. And uh, we can talk animal units with dairy cows uh, that typically we're factoring it down to a thousand pound cow. Uh, for the CAFO units and for permitted livestock operations, there's whole charts on what is an animal unit and it's all converting those animals to what a thousand pound cow would do. Uh, that way we're converting two things. One, what that animal eats and two, um, the manure that that animal produces all to one standard unit of measure. So animal unit follows along with uh, what we talk about with dry matter. You know, it's, it's kind of a conversion ratio for us. So then animal unit day is how much forage an animal eats per day, typically. If we're talking about animal unit day, we're talking about how much forage that they will consume in that day's time. Same with animal unit month, our, our soil surveys are typically put uh, in there for production under animal unit months. So that's animal units times 30 days to make it months of production. So uh, I know in the Western states, they use a lot of AUMs and AUDs uh, to talk about how much forage is out there. If they're renting pasture or if they're figuring out how much they have under a center pivot irrigation system, they talk about animal units and animal unit days. And the carrying capacity could be the carrying capacity for our entire operation, could be carrying capacity for a particular set of paddocks or paddock or one paddock for that matter. Um, but a carrying capacity is the standard set unit uh, for, for an area. So a lot of the grazing leases in the Western states are under carrying capacity. Um, they, they've got a set number of, of livestock and then typically they go back to animal units for for what that carrying capacity is on that particular piece of pasture. And then grazer, I, I threw grazer in there as a, uh, an animal in the un, animal unit category, but it really isn't. Grazer is us. It's, it's the farmer or the producer that is managing their animals in a grazing situation. As I said, I had to cut some slides. So uh, grazer was in another one, but I put this in there because every time I spell it out, I get the big red line in spell check. And I uh, just wanted to put that out there that I'm not misspelling it. Uh, that is actually considered us. That's us, the grazers. Uh, and anyone that manages their livestock in, in a grazing way can be considered a grazer. So uh, just a minute here on some what I consider marketing terms. Now, I know if you're reading down through there, you're saying, well, those are management terms, and they are. Uh, some For some of us, it's, it's lifestyle choices or farm style choices. Uh, but to me, I, I tend to put these in a marketing type category because this is how folks choose to market their products. Um, I, I guess I put this in here because I, I end up seeing a lot of things on social media and, and out there in the community where folks are poking fun at one marketing avenue or another and uh, I, I always call it back it, it's all marketing we're, we're all in this together uh, two percent of the population or less are farmers and uh, so we don't have any room to to kind of worry about how someone else chooses to market their product these, these are marketing avenues they're ways for us to market a product so organic organic is is a, done by a certifying agency you have to be certified organic 
to sell organic products. Um, now there is a loophole there where you can sell less than so many thousand dollars and call yourself organic, but for the most part, those those folks are certified. They've got a certifying agency that looks into what they do, and and organic typically are not allowed to use certain products if they're not naturally derived. So one of the things we run into is is we can't use uh, treated fence posts sometimes with organic things uh, because that's a, not a naturally derived product. Um, organic too gets into the discussion of pesticides. You know they're not allowed to use a lot of the pesticides. They do use some. Uh, they the ones that they use are, are typically naturally derived pesticides. They don't use a lot of synthetic fertilizers, but they do use compost, manure, or other things. Um, natural kind of follows along with that organic um, type thing. The, the natural, and I'm not sure whether natural even had, whether they have their own label or not. I, I'm not really up on that, but the natural folks uh, typically tend to, to say that their stuff is pasture raised. Uh, so pasture raised poultry or, or, or hogs on pasture. Um, they're, they're considering that they're natural because there, there are some folks that raise organic products that raise them in a more conventional setting, but they, they use an organic feed and, and follow some of the organic practices. So the, the natural folks are kind of differentiating themselves away a little bit by saying that it was naturally raised. And then grass fed and grass finished kind of is a, a sticky situation sometimes um, as, as they started marketing products as grass fed. Uh, we found that that some producers can say, well, it was grass fed, it had grass or had forage, but it was also fed a, a grain product one way or another. And so the grass finished has then kind of come up from, from there uh, to denote that the product or the, the livestock was produced using only forage, uh, typically is what the grass finished would, would say. Uh, conventional then is is the conventional way of doing things with they're following a conventional kind of uh, way of agriculture and, and doing things in the conventional way and, and and that's not to be derogatory of the conventional folks uh, I I firmly keep myself uh, on the fence on on all of these marketing what I consider marketing terms uh, because I see merits in in all of them I think all of them have some good points and and all of them uh, work for themselves and, and and that's why I consider it marketing because it's it's all in what works for that operation and how they choose to manage their operation how they choose to market their product well that's a wrap for this web presentation uh, I hope I helped you guys have a, a little more understanding about some grazing terms and some definitions for them uh, we'll end this presentation by thanking our sponsors I uh, hope you guys enjoyed what we've put together here. Um, also, while I'm here, I'll, I'll say uh, don't be afraid to, to go look up some of these grazing terms. If you enjoy our web presentations, there are really good YouTube videos out there about a lot of these topics uh, that you can pick up and watch. And, and some of them, there's even whole series of them. And I've kind of done that here uh, in this time that we seem to be faced with quite a bit because it's nice to just sometimes turn off the news and pull out a good YouTube presentation and, and boy have I really learned a lot over the last few weeks just doing that whenever I got a chance and um, really excited about the spring grazing season and what we've got coming up here especially with all the newfound things that, that I've kind of been watching and reading through. Uh, be looking for our virtual pasture walk next week. I believe we're going to start shooting some videos for it tomorrow and try to get it put together and have it turned out next Thursday. So thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.